Hello, it's Phil Thatch, and today I'm going to be making for you a comparison video of all five of my favorite mirrorless first party telephoto zoom lenses. And I'm going to be looking at them from the point of view of a bird photographer, not a landscape photographer or large wildlife photographer. This is all going to be about how do these work for birds. We're going to be looking at the super inexpensive RF 100 to 400 lens. We're going to look at the super expensive RF 100 to 500. We're going to talk about the brand new RF 200 to 800 lens. We're going to talk about the Sony 200 to 600 lens. And last but not least, we'll also talk about the new Nikon 180 to 600 lens. These are all great lenses for bird photography. And I'm going to discuss the high points and the low points of each of these lenses. I've had them all for quite some time. I've had I've had these two for a long, long time, but the other three I've only had for a month or two, but I've taken thousands of shots with all of them and I have formulated some opinions. Now, all of these opinions and scores, these are my opinions and scores. You may have a completely different idea. This is my video. If you've got a different idea, go ahead and you make a video too and I'd be glad to watch it. Or you can talk about it in the comments, but don't flame me or call me a moron. These are just my opinions and my ideas on these, and uh, your opinion may be different. I'd love to hear it, but be nice. The first of the 12 areas I'm gonna score these lenses on is range. And obviously the 100 to 400 is the shortest, and I gave it six points. I'm scoring all these out of 10. I gave it six out of 10. It would be good, or really good, in, in fact, on a 1.6 crop type of a Canon camera. I don't recommend this for a full frame camera if you're doing birds, especially small birds, but six points for the 100 to 400. I gave the 100 to 500 eight points. It's got a hundred extra millimeters and it is super sharp. So you can crop a lot with images made with this lens. In third place, I gave the Sony 200 to 600 eight and a half points which is really nice out of 10, eight and a half out of 10 is great. With slightly more range, the 180 to 600 Nikon lens gets nine points. And with a perfect 10, it's the new lens, the 200 to 800 lens. A zoom lens, relatively small, that zooms out all the way to 800 millimeters gets a 10 from me in this competition. The next category is maximum aperture. None of these lenses scores great in the maximum aperture department. The fastest of the lenses are these two, the Sony and the Nikon are both 6.3 at their maximum zoom. And 6.3 is still pretty slow. But I gave the Nikon, I gave it 7.5 and the Sony, I only gave seven. And the reason these two lenses with the same maximum aperture were scored differently is because the Nikon, you can pretty much consistently shoot it wide open without too much trouble. And the Sony, when you shoot it wide open, you often have some chromatic aberration. So I docked it a half a point for that because usually you have to stop it down some. Next up is the 100 to 500. It's 7.1 in terms of maximum ap aperture. And I gave it six and a half points, uh, almost as much as the Sony because the Sony, a lot of times you have to shoot at 7.1 and this one you can shoot at 7.1 wide open for this lens and have no problems at all with chromatic aberration. The 100 to 400 at 400 millimeters is F8, which is pitiful, but it's a compromise to get it this small and light and inexpensive. And I gave it five points. The big 200 to 800 is the slowest of them all, F9, when you're at 800 millimeters. And it's 6.3 all the way zoomed in to 200 millimeters, which is what the two highest point grabbers are at their maximum length. So it gets only four points in the maximum aperture competition. Next up is storability. How well will these lenses fit in your camera bag? And tied for last are the 200 to 600 and the 200 to 800 lenses. They both actually store at about the same size and I gave them each six points. The Nikon 180 to 600 is just a little bit smaller. I mean, maybe a quarter of an inch, maybe three eighths of an inch smaller than those two lenses. But that difference allows it to fit in my low pro pro runner 300 bag with a body attached where those other two don't. And so I gave it seven points. 
the 100 to 500 is tiny by comparison to those other lenses and I can fit it with a body attached in my low pro pro runner 200 the other ones don't even fit in my 300 except for one and this one fits easily in my 200 series bag a very small bag I gave it 9.5 out of 10 and the budget 100 to 400 gets a perfect 10 because it is tiny not only will it fit in the 200 series bag it'll fit in one of the side pockets in the 200 series bag it's fantastic in terms of storability now let's talk about how much these lenses weigh first place goes as you would have guessed to the 100 to 400 it is light as a feather 1.4 pounds i gave it a perfect 10. the 100 to 500 weighs three pounds i gave it nine points it's really light especially considering what it can do and how sharp it is the Nikon 180 to 600 weighs 4.3 pounds and I gave it seven points. The big 200 to 800 weighs 4.5 pounds. That's two tenths of a pound more, but it has 200 extra millimeters of range. So I gave it seven points as well. The Sony lens weighs 4.65 pounds. That's a little bit more than the 200 to 800, but it has less focal length. So I dropped it down to six points to bring up the rear in the weight category. Next, let's talk about how these lenses do with teleconverters. Both the 180 to 600 Nikon lens and the 200 to 600 Sony lens will take a teleconverter. And if you put a 1.4 on there, they end up at F9, including the teleconverter. We've got a lens in this competition that's at F9 without a teleconverter. So I gave both of these a 10 in terms of taking a teleconverter. Tied for second place is the 100 to 400 Canon lens and the 200 to 800. Both of these will take a teleconverter. They end up with astronomically high aperture numbers, really small aperture openings with a teleconverter, but they'll both take one and they'll both zoom the full range of the lens. And bringing up the rear in the teleconverter category is the 100 to 500. It will take a teleconverter and at its maximum zoom with a 1.4 on there, it's only F10. And that's not as bad as the 200 to 800 and the 100 to 400. But if a teleconverter is attached, it can't zoom all the way back. You can only go from 300 to 500 with a teleconverter installed. So because of that limitation, I gave it a seven. Okay, now we're starting to get into the subjective areas that these are my opinion and you, your opinion may differ. And first we're gonna talk about the quality feel of these lenses. In last place, I, I put the Canon 100 to 400, which actually doesn't feel bad. It doesn't feel like a piece of junk, but it just doesn't feel as nice as these other lenses. And I gave it a five. Both of these lenses feel about the same to me, even though this one, the 100 to 500 is a premium series L series lens. And this one is not. I gave both of these lenses an eight, mainly because their external zoom just feels kind of cheaper than the two winners in this category. And tying for the win in this category is the Sony 200 to 600 with its internal zoom and the Nikon 180 to 600. Both of these lenses feel really nice, really premium, and I gave them both a nine. All right, now we're getting really subjective and I don't have charts and graphs to back up these figures, but now we're gonna talk about sharpness and this is just the way it looks to me. I'm not pixel peeping here. I'm just talking about when I take photographs with these lenses, this is how I would rank them in terms of sharpness. Bringing up the rear with a seven, which is not bad out of 10, especially for a $649 lens, is the 100 to 400. And tying the 100 to 400 is an also really inexpensive for what it can do with that 800 millimeter focal length. I give the 200 to 800 a seven out of 10 for sharpness. These two lenses tie in terms of sharpness to my eye. I'm giving them both a nine. It's the Sony 200 to 600 and the Nikon 180 to 600. And the sharpness winner with a perfect 10 is the Canon 100 to 500. That's the way I see it. This one's the sharpest. Very subjective category now, it's image quality. Now image quality and sharpness are not the same thing, although sharpness does have a lot to do with image quality. Let's talk about it. I gave the 100 to 400 a six out of 10 for image quality. It's pretty sharp, but the images just don't look, if I land it perfectly sharp, as sharp as you can get it with this lens, it just doesn't look the overall image doesn't look as nice as some of the ones that beat it. Same thing with the 200-800. I gave it a 6.5 in image quality. I've got some images with this that are really, really sharp, but somehow they just don't look quite as nice as some of my best images with the lenses that finished higher in this competition. Really like this lens. 
but I give it a 6.5 for image quality overall. I gave the Sony lens, the 200 to 600 lens, I gave it a 7.5 out of 10 for image quality. I think if it didn't have chromatic aberration wide open, I probably would have scored it higher, but 7.5 out of 10 is pretty good. And I've got some images with this lens that I really love. In second place, it's the 100 to 500. I gave it nine out of 10. Now, wait a minute, this one had a perfect 10 on sharpness. Why has it only got a nine out of 10 in image quality? Well, the lens that beat it just tends to produce better looking pictures and I don't know why. In first place on image quality, I'm giving it to the Nikon 180 to 600. I'm giving it a 9.5 out of 10. The images that I've been able to make with this lens are just beautiful. I really love the way it renders. And I don't know if that's, a lot of people say Nikon colors are better. I don't, I don't know what it is, but it just, they tend to look a little bit better than even my best images with these other lenses. 9.5 out of 10 for the Nikon 180 to 600. All right, now let's talk about these lenses' maximum magnification. Last place is the Sony. It is a 0.2x magnification. I'm giving it six points. This category is for like if you want to use these lenses to photograph butterflies. And every single one of these, all five of these lenses can be used to photograph butterflies. Uh, some of them might do better with a teleconverter or on a crop sensor body, but they're all very capable of butterfly photography, which I think is a, a something that a lot of people who buy these lenses, in addition to shooting birds, they'll also do butterfly photography. So six out of 10 for the Sony. In fourth place, it's the new lens, the 200 to 800 from Canon. It has a 0.25X magnification at 200 millimeters and a 0.2 at 800 millimeters. So at its maximum uh, extension, it matches the Sony lens. I gave it a seven instead of a six like I gave the Sony just because you can get a little more magnification at 200 millimeters, but you really wanna be further out when you're doing your butterfly photography. Still, it is capable. I did not rate these lenses on minimum focus distance because it would kind of give you a doubling of this category. But you know, a lot of people have worried about the minimum focus distance of this 200 to 800 lens, but I have not found it to limit me at all when doing bird photography. When I shoot with my 800 f11, that minimum focus distance will occasionally cause problems, but I've never run into a, oh, I need to back up situation with this lens. In third place, also with seven points, it's the Nikon 180 to 600 at 0.25X. Second place at 0.33X and eight points, it's the 100 to 500. This is a very capable butterfly lens without a teleconverter. And if you put it on a crop sensor camera, it's amazing. But first place goes to this lens. This is the best butterfly lens I've ever owned. It goes to 0.41X magnification. Now, if sometimes you see lenses that aren't really macro lenses, but they call them macro lenses, and the minimum magnification to get that designation is 0.5X. So this is pretty close to 0.5X. It's almost a macro lens. I gave it nine out of 10. If it had gotten to 0.5X, I would have given it a perfect 10. Now that we've looked at lots of areas, about these lenses. Another important thing about these lenses has nothing to do with the lenses themselves. It's the systems that you can use them in. And first I'm gonna rate these lenses on how their system is in terms of APS-C bodies. And in last place, with only 3.5 points, the lowest score I've given any of these lenses is the Nikon 180 to 600 in terms of APS-C bodies that are available for it. You've got the Z50, which doesn't have eye detect autofocus for birds. You got the ZFC. These are just not great wildlife camera bodies. I feel like Nikon's gonna make one pretty soon and this could go up to a nine or 10, but right now I'm only giving the 180 to 600 a 3.5 in terms of APS-C bodies available for it. In fourth place with seven points, it's the Sony 200 to 600. They just released the A6700, which is a pretty darn good wildlife camera, but it's not as good as the Canon APS-C bodies, in my opinion. Both the R10 and especially the R7 beat it, in my opinion. Subjective, your opinion may vary. I gave the Sony seven out of 10. And all three of the Canon lenses, the 100 to 400, the 100 to 500, and the 200 to 800, I gave nine out of 10 for APS-C bodies. They've got the R7 and the R10, which are both great. And there's other APS-C bodies that are pretty good, but they've got the best right now in terms of APS-C bodies that can be used with these lenses. It's a completely different story 
with full frame cameras. In last place, I've got the 100 to 400. This lens needs a really high resolution full frame camera. And in full frame cameras, they have a thing called stacked sensors, which none of these lenses have a body that would, has a stack sensor for APS-C. But for full frame, all three brands have a stack sensor camera, but Canon's stack sensor camera, the R3, is only 24 megapixels. You could put this on the R5, but, and it has plenty of resolution, but it's not a stack sensor and some of the other brands have stack sensors. So four points for the 100 to 400. I gave the 100 to 500 five points. It's using the same full frame camera bodies, but with its 100 extra millimeters, those full frame bodies are more useful. This thing's great on an APS-C body, but only pretty good on a full frame body. I gave the 200 to 800 seven. Same camera bodies, but the 800 millimeter part of this lens makes that 24 megapixel R3 stack sensor camera a viable alternative for bird photography. Tied for first place with nine points each in terms of full frame camera bodies that they can work with. It's the 200 to 600 and the 180 to 600. Sony has the A1, which has a high resolution stack sensor body that would be great for this camera. And Nikon has two cameras that have high resolution and a stack sensor, the Z8 and Z9. These are tied for first place with nine points. Next, we're gonna talk about MSRP, manufacturer's suggested retail price and value. I was going to give points on MSRP and points on value, but that kind of double dipped being mean to the expensive lenses and super nice to the cheap lenses. So let's just look at the prices first. The cheapest one is the 100 to 400. It's $649. I actually got mine on sale for $549 and I've seen it for sale as cheap as $499, but the MSRP is $649. It's amazing to me that Nikon is selling this 180 to 600 for only $16.99. What an amazing lens for that price. I'm pretty impressed as well that this 200 to 800 is only $18.99. I would have figured at least $22, $2,300 for this lens, but $18.99, it's pretty much a bargain. The 200 to 600 Sony lens lists for $19.99. I got mine on sale for $18.99, but the MSRP is $19.99. And by far the most expensive lens in this comparison is also the only one that's listed as a premium lens. It's the only L series lens. The rest of these lenses, the rest of the Canon lenses are not L series lens. The Sony lens is not a G master, just a G. And the Nikon lens is not an S series lens. So this one's the most expensive. It's $28.99 is the current MSRP. I bought mine when the MSRP was $26.99 and then they raised the price 200 bucks. Here's the most expensive lens in the competition. But how are they in terms of value for your dollar? Well, number one is the 100 to 400 at only $649. It's very capable, especially on a crop sensor camera like the R7. I'm giving it a 10 for value. The 180 to 600 comes in second with a 9.5 out of 10. I probably could have given this thing a 10, except for it's like more than twice the price of the first place lens, but wow, what a lens this is for the price they sell it for. Third place in value with a score of eight is the 200 to 800. That's a bargain for the price that they're selling this thing for. I gave the Sony 200 to 600 seven out of 10. It's a great lens at a fairly reasonable price. I also gave the Canon 100 to 500 seven out of 10. Even though it's the most expensive lens, it's still scored high because it's so sharp, has such great image quality, has lightweight, it's easily storable. It's just an amazing lens and pretty much worth the money. I gave it seven out of 10 for value. Now I excluded a lot of lenses. I don't own the lenses that I excluded. There are several third party lenses from Sigma and Tamron that I could have included in this competition, but I didn't. So I ended up making it all first party lenses. I could have also put the Sony and the Nikon 100 to 400 lenses in here. They're a lot more expensive and maybe a little better quality, but they're not really bird lenses in my opinion. Now you would say, well, why do you have this 100 to 400 in here as a bird lens? Well, this is a budget bird lens. If you put this 100 to 400 on an APS-C camera, it becomes a bird lens. But to me, all these are bird lenses. This lens right here, the 100 to 500, probably would compete with those 100 to 400s, but because it's got the extra 100 millimeters, it also becomes a bird lens. And it's just a great competition. And I think this thing crushes the 100 to 400 from 
Sony and Nikon just because it's got that extra reach, it's better storable, and it still has all the great features that those other 100 to 400s have and 100 extra millimeters. All right, now let's get to the point totals. In last place with a respectable 89 points, it's the 100 to 400. Even though it doesn't have the best image quality the, or the best quality feel or the best sharpness, it's still scored high because it's so inexpensive and so storable and has such a great ability to photograph small things from a little bit of a distance. The 100 to 400 scores 89. In fourth place with a score of 89.5, it's Canon's new lens, the 200 to 800, 89.5 is the score. Its weakness was image quality and sharpness. It just wasn't as sharp as some of the ones that scored ahead of it. It did well on price. It struggled on weight and storability and maximum magnification. In third place, it's the Sony 200 to 600 with a score total of 92.5. It did well in pretty much every category, except for maybe storability and maximum image quality. Suffered some because of the chromatic aberration that this lens often displays wide open, but still it's a great lens and it got a score of 92.5. In second place with a score of 96, it's the fantastic Canon 100 to 500 lens. It did well in basically every category except price and maybe maximum reach hurt it a little bit, but it's so light and so sharp and has such great image quality, it got 96 points total. And the winner, with a score of 97, just edging out the 100 to 500 by a single point, it's Nikon's new 180 to 600 lens. It did well in basically every category. It did great in price, it did great in value, it did great in image quality, it did great in sharpness, it only struggled a little bit in weight and storability, and it kind of struggled a little bit more in maximum magnification. But overall, this is the winner. Its biggest struggle, this lens, was it. there's just no APS-C cameras that are great enough to go with this great lens. And I often go out shooting with my Nikon Z50, as I've mentioned a hundred times on the channel. I shoot with this camera, even though it's nowhere near as good as my Sony APS-C cameras or my Canon APS-C cameras, I still get this old camera out and use it just because this lens is so great. So only four points in that category. If, if they make a good APS-C wildlife camera, this thing's lead is gonna get even bigger. The winner is the Nikon 180 to 600. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this competition. Please feel free to leave me a comment if you disagree or if you agree or somewhere in the middle. Try not to flame me or be too awfully mean to me if you disagree. It's okay to disagree, just you don't have to be hateful about it. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, take a moment, reach down, give me a thumbs up. If you wanna see some more content like this and all sorts of photography content, subscribe and hit the notification bell. And as always, I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Bye-bye.